It's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this first offering of <coughs> Journalism 101, which is a, a course uh, come workshop put on by the Science Media Center of Canada, SMCC. And uh, the purpose of the workshop is to, and I quote, assist researchers in understanding how the media thinks and operates. So uh, the experience that you will gain today will, we, we believe, help you as researchers to get your key points across with clarity and effectiveness during an interview and improve your credibility and rapport with, uh, with journalists. But let me just uh, back off a little bit and explain how this all came about. Some time ago, perhaps a, a year ago, Alan Frank and I recognized that Wynne needed a set of media ambassadors uh, who could help us to convey to the media, to the broader public, and to, the young, and to young people, not only what nanotechnology is all about, but also the excitement and impact of the research uh, which is being pursued in, a, in our institute. But beyond the need to get the message out about Wynne, we also recognize that uh, as a leading edge institute in a relatively new field of advanced technology, we have a social responsibility, I might say a social contract, to engage in public dialogue and debate to inform society not only about the grand challenges of science and how nanotechnology can contribute to solving those problems, but also the lights and shadows, uh, the good and the bad, uh, of new technology. So we've selected a group of 18 members of WIN, representative of the full spectrum of research that's going on in our institute, and we're committed to providing our best support for them to communicate their stories, their understanding, and their inspiration to a largely lay audience, lay audience through the media. And some of you, I, I think, have already participated in media interviews since that time. Now, uh, I think we're all probably aware of the fact that it's not enough just to know your stuff. One of my father's favorite expression, expressions was, a wink is as good as a nod to a blind horse. So if you can't communicate in, an effective, in a way that effectively gets the message across, all is lost. To be heard and understood, scientists and engineers must not only be technically competent, they must understand and be savvy about how the media works. So whether you're responding as scientists to an inbound request for a deadline, from a deadline-driven uh, journalist for expert commentary, or participating as a guest on a TV panel, uh, you must be prepared in your response and ready to work within the norms, the cultures, and the values of the journalistic system. So you could see that uh, an interaction with a journalist should perhaps, uh, would perhaps better be seen as a partnership uh, to help leverage your credibility and knowledge to deliver a message with impact and thereby to influence the level of discussion and the debate on the issues. Uh, we were fortunate uh, indeed that the creation of our media ambassadors coincided with the founding and the launch of the Science Media Center of Canada last year. And after talking to Penny Park, whom you'll hear about uh, in a minute, we realized there was an opportunity for Wynne to be the first partner in Journalism 101. So to get the program underway, let me introduce the principal individuals involved today and thank them on behalf of Wynne. First of all, and perhaps if, while I mention your name, you could stand. First of all, Penny Park, who, Penny is here, who is the Executive Director of the Science Media Center of Canada. Penny has extensive hands-on experience in radio and TV journalism. From 1980 to 1995, she worked on Quirks and Quarks as a producer. And from 1995 to 2009, she was uh, uh, with the Discovery Channel developing Daily Planet, the first nightly TV magazine show in the world devoted to science and technology. She's also done uh, week-long specials on science and technology in Japan, in Brazil, uh, India, and uh, China. So Penny herself will tell you more about the SMCC, why it was created, and its objectives. Uh, after Penny, we have a journalist uh, panel discussion, which will be moderated by Peter Kalamai. Peter, 
uh, friend uh, for many years. Peter was a founding member of the Canadian Science Writers Association in 1970 and was the national science reporter of the Toronto Star from 1998 to 2008. Uh, Peter uh, won the, the, CAP, the Canadian Association of Physicists Kirk B. Medal in 2008 for outstanding service to, to Canadian physics. Then we have special guests on the panel. Jim Handman, executive producer of Quirks and Quarks, uh, and also uh, two journalists, Rob Davidson, a TV journalist. Where's Rob? Where's Rob? And producer, and finally, Graham Stemp Murlock, a freelance science uh, writer. So finally, I, I, I'd uh, uh, stop there and welcome all of the participants from WIN uh, and our fellow institutes, IQC, WISE, Watcar, the Perimeter Institute, and the university more generally. So let's get the show on the road. Any? Peter, you, you, yeah, Peter's, Peter's going to say a few words. I'm, okay. I'm just going to okay. make sure you're wired up for something. Oh, okay. Actually, I kind of yell a lot. So I only just sound like I need the mic for back there. Oh, I see. Art, you, got the, you got the mic. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. It was good walking off with it. Oh, very good. Can you put it on there? Yeah. Thank you. I'll just put this here. And hopefully that's... Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cardi. Thank you, Wynne. Um, this is very exciting for us to be uh, doing our inaugural Journalism 101. And thank you very much, Peter Kalamai, and all the members of the panel, too, for, for coming and offering your time. The Science Media Centre of Canada just opened our doors. We just opened our doors at the end of uh, September. And basically, we're a nonprofit uh, organization, a charitable organization, here to help journalists cover science when it hits the headlines. Um, the vision is to inform public debate with evidence based, accurate science. And as you'll hear, you actually might be receiving calls not only from journalists like the journalists on the panel here, but from us. Because really what we're doing as the um, journalism community is being stressed and overworked and the financial model has kind of collapsed. Our colleagues in the journalism field are finding less time to cover stories, uh, less support, to do science. Our, the science journalism community is shrinking. So we are there to help uh, as a conduit between you, the scientists, and the journalists. The sorts, uh, it originated, the idea actually originated in the UK about 10 years ago with the genetically modified organism kerfuffle where uh, scientists were increasingly alarmed as the front pages had pictures of half goat, half humans, and you know, frankenfoods were the, was the topic of the day. So the Science Media Center concept uh, was developed. It has now spread to, from um, the UK, it is also now, there is one in Australia and New Zealand, one has just opened in Japan, one will be opening in, um, in Denmark uh, in August. Again, we're here to help the media do better. Uh, the target is the overworked general assignment reporter, feature writers, editors, producers. And so the sorts of things that we do at the base of our service um, are experts. And we have a list, a large list of, uh, that's growing every day of, uh, of scientists covering all areas of science. Everything, health, we use the term broadly, technology, um, even the social sciences, so ethics and policy uh, as well, um, as well as sort of the hard sciences and physics and engineering and all the rest of it. Um, we have, the way we're set up is that we have a research advisory panel, uh, which is uh, you know, very um, well-respected scientists in a, a number of different, uh, about 20 so far, 
20 areas of science that we can turn to to ensure that we're on the scientifically straight and narrow. We have an editorial advisory committee of journalists too to make sure that journalistically we are in keeping with journalistic ethics. Uh, Peter Calamai is the chair of that editorial advisory committee. Jim Hanman also sits on it. We also have um, the chief um, uh, news bureau uh, person for Radio Canada. The service is provided in French and English as well. And we can, for the journalists, if there's a story you're facing that day, you can give us a call. Uh, need help, I'm doing a story on, um, you know, medical isotopes, uh, on uh, an earthquake, whatever, and we can direct you to uh, scientists who can help speak well and with authority on that topic. Um, we have regular webinars. We've had three so far, which will allow us to bring together the scientists and the journalists so that our webinars have included, for example, the last one we did was on the um, Royal uh, Society's oil sands um, report, and we did it a day before it was embargoed so that the journalists, when the report actually came out, the journalists will, would have heard from four members of that panel and would have time to read up, think about it, and ask questions. They could be in Calgary, they could be in Halifax, because it was all a webinar on, on the internet and the scientists, in fact, were spread out across the country. And um, we also provide backgrounders, expert back backgrounders, and that sort of thing. We're looking at providing images in the future so that there will be a graphics bank uh, which for people in nanotechnology of course and quantum physics having animations will be incredibly important the Australians have found for example that if they add a, an image of some kind to their story, they increase uptake of that story by about 30 or 40 percent. And, you know, I'm of the um, NASA school of thought uh, that if you make it beautiful, television for sure, and the internet will run it because everybody likes to look at those beautiful pictures and NASA of course has fought against things that can't be seen for um, for ages so people in the nanotechnology area will uh, also understand that in physics um, so far what we've accomplished is we've in the two three months that we've been open we have put out alerts, heads ups, um, this is what's coming up, this is what's going to be published this week. Um, we have uh, had three webinars. We have now 107, over 175 journalists who are registered for our, uh, for our um, services. And they are saying that they appreciate it, that um, you know, nature, I've heard the SMCC is capable of magic, Radio Canada, your alerts are as good, if not better than my own, and recommending that the reporters there um, sort of get on board. So I think it's making a difference. Certainly part of that is having you part of our, um, our organization as well, stepping forward, part of the equation is journalists and scientists and um, and knowing that you're interested in communicating your story being available for journalists and helping through the journalists understand the science and the importance of what you're doing um, is really I think it really imperative so it is for that reason that we wanted to have these Journalism 101 sessions so that you can get a bit of a peek into the life of the journalist so you know what to expect and what's happening kind of on the other, on the other side of the phone when that phone call comes. 
and also maybe reaching out to the Science Media Centre if you think there are stories coming your way. If you're looking down the horizon and say, oh, this is coming, this is important, this should be discussed, then to give us a call too and say, heads up, this is coming, and I think it's something worth discussing. So um, thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to working with you in the future. So I, I thought uh, after Penny called me up and then Peter called me and, and I thought what, what I could do is tell you what I do or have done. I, I wouldn't presume to tell you folks how you can take your research and make it more clear for me or anything else. But if I give you a sense of what my problems are, what my issues are, uh, sort of my broadcast news day, it might help you to, to get your head around what happens when you get a phone call from Penny or a phone call from somebody like me. I started in Global in 1990. In 1990, we had a science reporter working at, in the newsroom. That doesn't exist anymore. So likely, you're going to be getting a phone call from a general assignment guy who came in, this is the way it works, at 9.30 that morning. His assignment editor, or her assignment editor, said, I want you to go to Waterloo and you're going to be talking to a guy about chemistry. Already I'm ready to shoot myself. <laughs> and you're going to have to come back tonight and you're going to put it on the air. So you're going to get a phone call from me about, I'm going to start making research, call up Penny, I'll call up some buddies. If you're already in my Rolodex, you are going to hear from me. I may be calling you to say, I need someone to talk to me about this subject, who would I talk to? You're going to hear from me by no later than probably about 10.30, 10.45 in the morning. And I am already sweating. I'm already got a deadline facing me like a brick wall of 6 o'clock that night. My edit time is at 3 o'clock. If I've got a prick for an assignment editor, which by the way I probably do, because they're the most hated person in the newsroom, he's going to want me to go out and do a live pop somewhere that's cold and miserable and ugly and has absolutely nothing to do with the story, but he's going to do it because he hates my guts. <laughs> so, I'm going to call you, and, and if we can get uh, my deadline, you keep the, and really important, the deadline's really important here. I need you to agree <laughs> to talk to me. That's all I want. If, you, if, if I'm calling you, I have an idea that you've got something that I need you to say. The first thing I'm going to do is talk with you. I'm going to talk with you for a little bit to find out, number one, can you talk? Can you put four words together and make them make sense? Are you coherent? Uh, it's from something as banal as does he, she stutter to can they actually impart the information that I require? I, by the way, if you haven't already figured it out, I have an agenda. I've already been given the story. I know what the story is. I'm not trying to find the story. I know what the story is. So what I'm trying to do is get you to tell me your piece of that puzzle that is going to go on the air that night. So I'm going to call you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to find out if you can talk. I'm going to find out if you've, if you've got a really strong handle on the information that I need to impart. And I'll get to what my biggest, most important question is at the end. I'll come back to that. The really important question. The one, because I'm TV. I'll get to that in a second. Then we're going to make an appointment, and it's going to be fast. I've got to get in the truck. I've got to get the cameraman. We've got to get down there. We've got to shoot the thing. We're going to come in. We're going to get in everybody's way. We're going to knock something over. We're going to spill some water. We're going to drink some coffee. We're going to look, act arrogant and stupid, but we're going to sit there, and we're going to ask the questions, and you're going to probably hear me say, can you say it like this? Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you, I'm not going to, 95% of the time, I don't have an agenda to misrepresent you. 95% of the time, uh, my agenda is, can I make this person fit into that hole that I've got, that black hole that I've got waiting for me? So I, I might need you to say, well, when the little teeny weeny particles are joined up over here with this little team. I, I need you to, to actually give me the root in, the line in. I'll, so I'm not, don't be resistant to this. 
work with me. As I said, 95% of the time, I am not trying to screw around with you. I'm trying to make sure that you fit into my story. Tell me if you think, and by the way, you can ask me, you can say, what is the story exactly? What sort of story are you doing? You know, engage me on that so that you know what it is that I'm doing, and you can help me, therefore, kind of shoehorn your material into the story. And then at that point, once I've finished with you, and by the way, I'll probably have glazed eyes, and I probably will only be sort of paying attention to me, because, to you, I mean, because I'm already thinking of the three other people that I got to get to that morning to get the clips that I need to put my story together and get it on the air somewhere cold where it's snowing and outside when you're at home eating. And, and I'm, I'm going to get to the most important question now that I will ask you, and it's a really important, Penny um, referenced it, and that is, what am I going to see? I, I, I need more than just your clever words. I'm looking for pictures, I'm looking for uh, video, I know you won't have it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, photographs, illustrations. Graham and I were talking, I won't steal your thunder, but Graham and I were talking earlier, and we like astronomers because they always have a picture. You know, it's a galaxy or a star or something like that. Chemists, sorry, not so much. Um, nanotechnology. Man, the number of nanotechnology people that I have talked to uh, over the last five years working for Discovery uh, and, and I've, I've dropped, I've dropped every single one of the stories. I ended up walking away from every single nanotechnology story because there wasn't anything that I could really put in front of an audience to explain it. I had some great people who were really good at talking, and, and, and that's important, but TV is, is picture-driven. It's, it's visual driven, it's not a magazine. I can't tell you the number of times that a, a Simon editor has passed me a story where I've gone, this is a really great magazine story and it's a really crappy TV story because there's no visuals. There's no pictures to go with it. Which brings me around to the little piece of video that I brought you today. This guy, we, we were doing in Daily Planet, the Penny's show that she started, the, the nightly. Our, it, what we try to do is get people because, by the way, they're listening. Most people at supper time-ish don't actually watch the TV. They're mostly listening while they're peeling potatoes. And I'm trying to get you to put down the peeler and the potato and come in and watch something. And they're not going to do that while, they're, while the radio show's on. I've got to show them a picture so that you can actually see something. So you're not, holy Orville, look at this. This is really cool. So. We're doing a story on a week-long special on the environment, and uh, there was one guy, a guy named Roger Angel, some of you here may know him, down in the University of Tucson, and he had an idea, he had an idea, this was for environment, his idea was to help stop um, UV rays from killing the planet, and, but it was just an idea. Roger had an idea. I talked with him on the phone, by God, he was a good speaker. He could really articulate his idea. It was a big engineering project. But he had bupkis. He had nothing else. It was just an idea. But the idea, this is, the, this is sort of, if I can, this is this backing off. This is sort of the other side of that coin, where we wanted him on the air so badly, because we loved his idea, that we actually paid our, we got our graphics guys working weeks before I ever went down to shoot them to start creating the graphics and then there are researchers to try to find the, the stock footage and so on to try to create the visuals around this guy's really cool idea. So, I'll shut up. Why don't we have a peek at this guy's cool idea? Hopefully. We figured out how to cut down the sun's rays, hats, umbrellas, anything to create shade. So if the sun is too hot for the planet, why not an umbrella for the Earth? In general, to reduce the intensity of the sun, you need something between you and the sun, right? To block some of that light. He is great. Angel knows a thing or two about light. As an astronomer, he designs the lenses for those big telescopes. People have talked about things in Europe, orbit, 
And I'm looking at the sort of most distant solution, which is this stable point in space, which is a million miles toward the sun. Uh, and if you put something in orbit there, it will stay in line with the sun, pretty much. So it's one uh, place that you can sort of put a shade. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there's more carbon dioxide in the air now than any time in the last 650,000 years. Angel figures a 2% reduction in the sun's rays will get the Earth's temperature back to pre-industrial levels. The shadow cast uh, from this object a million miles away covers the whole globe. And it turns out, if you look at the area of the whole planet, and you want to reduce the, the sunshine by 2%, then you need something that's 2% of, of this area of the globe. And that turns out to be a million square miles. So whatever it is that's up there needs to be a million square miles in order to reduce the flux by 2%. But then it'll be even over the whole globe. Angel has designed a glass screen consisting of some 16 trillion tiny transparent individual shades. Each little shade is about two feet across, gossamer thin, and slightly faceted to diffuse the light. It's almost impossible to imagine glass this thin, but it's it's so thin it would just blow away in the in the breeze. So it's the glass I'm looking at would be one twentieth of one thousandth of an inch thick. And it's actually in miniature a little spacecraft that has a little brain and it's got some solar cells. The solar cells, the little tabs on the rim of the shade, would also use the light from the sun to steer them and keep them in place. But first, they have to get there. Angel looked at the Saturn V rocket, the same rocket that sent us to the moon. The most it can carry into space is 50 tons. The 16 trillion sunshades would weigh 20 million tons. That means you need 400,000 Saturn V launches to get the shades in place. So then, he launched a slab of aluminum. It turns out if you have a very large mass to send up, and you need many, many launches, that uh, electromagnetic force is, a, is, I think, a less expensive way to do it than chemical rocket. Angel demonstrates here by placing a slab of aluminum on top of an electromagnet. A blast of power sends the slice into the air. Oh! <laughs> I looked at a design where you sort of tunnel down into a mountain about two kilometers deep, you put the track in the tunnel, you start your payload at the bottom, and then it's accelerated magnetically to the point where it leaves the Earth's gravity. So to get the necessary 16 trillion shades into place, Angel has figured out we'll need to launch one rocket every minute for 10 years. The payload <laughs> will come to rest in roughly the shape of a cigar, 100,000 kilometers long, and a few thousand kilometers wide. It's so big, even a comet or asteroid ripping through it would have little impact on the shadow being cast. No, a comet isn't the problem. The best we can hope for would be a trillion dollars of, of transportation costs. And a trillion sounds, uh, but uh, it, a, a trillion bucks amortized over 20, 40 years is like a tenth of a percent of world uh, gross domestic product. And geoengineering is a last resort. I think it's something we need to understand now <coughs> to understand whether it's practical and what it would cost and what it would do and what the side effects would be and so on. But it's not the fix to global warming. Right? The fix to global warming has to be to reduce greenhouse gases. On top of that, the screen will only last 50 years. We'll have to perform the entire exercise over again. It's another trillion dollars. All right. So, there, you, can, you can see why we wanted it. Because it was a cool idea. Uh, ridiculous, and, and, but a cool idea. And, and I, I just, you know, just a sort of, a, a sort of behind the, moving that curtain aside, which is the wizard proved is pretty much all bullshit. The, the globe, uh, we saw that. We went down there, we had nothing. I knew that they were making the good graphics back at the shop, but we had nothing else. And, and he had the single, by the way, the single messiest office I've ever walked into in my life. It was just, it was, wow, where is, I could barely get into the door. But sitting on top of all these piles of paper and so on was this globe. 
And I had this flash. I went, okay, can, can you bring the globe outside with us when we go? So he, he went outside. And he said, what do you want with the globe? I said, well, we'll just put it here. And I started to talk with him. And then as we got talking, I then walked up and I said, well, now show me what you mean. He went, well, no, I can't do that. This, of course, didn't make the story. He said, why not? He says, I'm, I, I'm, it would be too much like Charlie Chaplin with the great dictator. I, I, I can't be holding a globe like this. And I went, yeah, he's absolutely right. Sure you can. <laughs> as you see, he ended up doing it anyway. All right. So as I said, that's, that's a story where we really wanted it. So we went out of our way to try to create the pictures that would, that would work for it. As you can see, a mixture of the, the girl with the thong bathing suit off the top to get your attention. And then the, you don't remember that? And, uh, and then, and then the, the animation. So we're here to help you. Two, by the way, a daily news problem program, not so much. Somebody like Daily Planet, if we really want you, we'll go out of our way to, to, to try to get you. The last thing I'll say, and I'll get out of here, let everybody else talk, is that if you're talking to a news reporter, and I hope you all are at some point, I really do, they're great folks, talk to them like they're a five-year-old. Talk to them like you're explaining your idea to a five-year-old. If a five-year-old can understand your idea then a news reporter can understand it. And if a news reporter can understand it, then they won't screw it up, by and large. That's it. Thanks, folks. So before, when I was preparing for, um, for coming to this, um, I talked with my wife, who's a grad student uh, in humanities, to sort of, because I wanted to know my audience. You know, what, uh, what are they going to say? What are they thinking? What is their interaction? I mean, I know my side of the microphone or the telephone. Uh, what, what's theirs? My wife, my wife said, uh, you don't, you're not interested in my opinion. I said, no, no, really, really, tell me. She said, you really sure? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah I want to know. So she said, uh, well, journalists have no methodology, no checks and balances, no expertise. Researchers spend months or years studying single details, and you guys spend an afternoon. Researchers use factual data, not opinions. We cite dozens of peer-reviewed sources. Or if we're going to get to do an interview with a real live person, we have to go through hundreds of questions from the Research Ethics Committee. Journalists say anything as long as it sells. Ouch. So, okay, um, why don't you tell me what you really think, honey? She, uh, I think she loves me, just not my job. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot of uh, problems there, and I think it gets to a root problem, which is the promise that my job has versus the promise that your job has. Your job's promise is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, Darwin. Um, you represent the facts. You do error bars. You do statistical analysis. You get good, hard data, and you present good, hard data to people who understand good, hard data. My job, my promise, is to entertain and inform. And entertain is superior. The Sudoku makes it in every paper. The horoscope is in every paper. There is no information in the horoscope whatsoever. We have art sections, film sections. We have sections on Angelina and Brad. And that is all entertainment. Information is secondary. That's why we don't have sections reviewing um, industrial standards. We don't have sections on the top user manual of the month. We don't have boring stuff. But you don't have to feel bad about that because science is interesting. Science is entertaining. I mean, look at our culture right now. We are an incredibly geeky culture right now. Tron, a movie about computer programming, for crying out loud. Lost, quantum, I don't even know what. Um, and there were thousands of people going over every minute detail, going over it and doing master's level research into what it was J.J. Abrams was exactly trying to say. I don't know, he just needed a picture. Um, the Big Bang Theory is a television show about physicists. It's incredibly popular. We love geeky stuff right now. We love science. You guys have the goods. You have what our society wants. 
The only problem is you have to tell it to us as if we're normal people. You use tough words, really big tough words that are tough for us to publish because it doesn't fit on one line. I'm a print journalist and I have to, I mean, I have to think of how many syllables it's going to be and do I have to explain it and how much time is it going to take to explain what you just said. So you have to know how to talk to normal people. That means things like using analogies, using metaphors. Uh, if you're doing research on carbon nanotubes, compare it to a, a straw, a noodle, anything, whatever you want. Um, if you don't, if you can't think of an analogy, okay, go and rip one off. <laughs> look online, look on Google News, look at what your peers have compared it to. You know, maybe someone else has a great analogy. You don't have to recreate the wheel every time, but you do have to know how to say what is you do. And the best way to do that is to do it a lot. Brian Greene is one of the best public communicators of science out there right now. And he studies one of the toughest areas of science, mathematical, theoretical, physics. Oh my gosh, it makes my head hurt just thinking about it. He writes kids' books. A kid's book. He gives popular lectures uh, to the TED conference, and they're hugely popular. He, give, he enti organizes entire uh, science festivals because he knows how to talk to people. When his maid, I'm sure he has one, maybe he doesn't, um, asks him, what did you do at the office today? He actually explains it. He doesn't just say, well, I filed some papers. He says, well, you know, I was really stumped on this one problem. It you know, relates to whatever. I don't want to steal Jim's thunder, but I have to bring to light an example from a past show recently that they did that was excellent. And I'm going to make sure I get my notes right on this one, because if I don't, Jim's going to kill me. Um, they were talking about, where is it here? Okay, so the fine galaxy structure. You should look, it's only like two weeks old. That's it, you got it. And it was, it's this mathematical formula relating to the universe and it's related to the Planck constant, the speed of light and the charge of an electron. Now, how is it related to all those things? Is it one over the other? Is it, you know, they don't say, don't need to. It's radio. We can't tell you one over whatever. They just do, just tell you it's related to it. And the people get it. I got it instantly. I was cooking lunch for my daughters. I got it. I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, it's related to those three things? Whoa. Well, that means blah, blah, blah. And I got it. And it, good job, guys. It was excellent. And so, you know, think about what, uh, what you need to say and how to say it in simpler terms. And if you can say it in simpler terms, and if you can present that analogy to me, I'm going to use it. I'm not going to create my own analogy. I'm going to use yours. Because you said it. It was a great idea. I'll use it. You can literally put words into my mouth. I will say what you say. And I will, I mean, I'm ultimately working for you guys in a sense. Because I don't want to make you look dumb. I don't want to make myself look dumb. It looks dumb when my editor calls me into this, you know, on the phone the next day and says, by the way, the researcher you talked to said you got everything wrong. That's a bad situation for me. So I'm always out there trying to represent the facts perfectly. Um, and I'll just end with uh, one last thought, um, which is to know your enemy. Um, Science, I believe, is one of the few areas where you have civil disagreements still. It, look at politics, we don't have civil disagreements. We have red and blue, and they're both idiots. You know, that's the other one is an idiot, they're an idiot. They're, they're, no one talks. We have question period, and it's not question period, it's yell at period. It, we don't disagree in public very well. Science still does. I have very rarely when I go to science conferences do I hear people calling each other idiot from the back row or throwing chairs at the presenter. It doesn't happen. You can even have sessions, I don't, this is amazing, where you have this guy here who believes thing A, this guy here who believes thing B, that guy there who believes thing, thing C, and they all disagree. And they all stand up at the end of it, shake hands and say, yeah, you, know, you had a good idea there, you're completely wrong, but it was an interesting idea. Go out and tell journalists that this is happening. 
go tell your friends that you can disagree with someone and it's okay and it works. This is, uh, you have found a way to disagree that society could use. And, you know, you guys kind of have an onus to spread that. The scientific method figured it out. And lastly, a thing I'll say, um, if you want some more concrete examples, I'm sure we're going to talk about stuff in the panel, but if you want some more concrete ideas of how to get your message heard when you have something cool, build rapport with journalists, um, get something noticed in the news, um, I post an article on my blog. You can just find my blog by Googling my name, which is in the program. Um, it's an article I actually wrote for uh, the United Church Observer magazine. Um, it was about, it was for ministers and churches trying to get their message heard because, um, oddly enough, science and religion are kind of in the same boat. They're both the first section to be cut of the newspaper. They're both um, kind of the elephant in the room, but no one cares. No one listens to us a lot of the time. Um, and so I wrote this uh, article for ministers. But if you replace the word minister with scientist or church with science or research lab, you'll get a good sense of some other tips and suggestions. So there we go. And I'll hand it over to Jim. All right, how many people in this room have been guests on Quirks and Quarks? One? That's it? OK, you guys are really getting your asses whooped by UBC, U Calgary, Edmonton is really killing you. Time to step up, Waterloo. Okay, just wanted to say that. Um, does everyone know what Quirks and Quarks is? Don't be afraid if you don't. No, you all know, excellent. Then you know that we face a challenge that my esteemed colleagues in print and in news don't face, which is we actually interview the lead author on papers and they have to explain the story themselves in their own words. We don't have the advantage of print people who can... Whoops. Okay. And that's got to be way louder. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the print journalists have the advantage. They can interview you for an hour, and all they need is one sentence out of that hour that makes any sense for the quote in the article. Um, my news colleagues, same thing. They can talk to you for an hour. Just, they just need the one ten-second clip that makes sense. We need to speak to you for 20 minutes and put all of it on the radio. So you have to be able to explain it all yourself in words that are clear, concise, and conversational. This is a huge challenge for scientists. I understand this. I've got a cartoon on my wall. Shows your kind of quintessential Einsteinian guy with the wild hair and the lab coat. And behind him is a huge blackboard filled with wild equations. And there's a reporter standing there with a notebook. And the scientist is saying, uh, layman's terms, I, I don't know any layman's terms. <laughs> and I gotta say, you bunch in this room are probably the worst offenders in the entire world of science. Clip one, please. ADS CFT correspondence, the anti de Sitter space time and gravity, and an asymptotically anti de Sitter space time, never mind what that space time is. Uh, corresponding to some so-called so conformal field theory, uh, which is an ordinary non-gravitational theory. Uh, 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 what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> this poor unnamed Canadian cosmologist was trying to explain back black holes to us. Um, so you guys have more jargon. You have jargon to explain your jargon. I understand that. Layman's terms do not come easily to you. Uh, there's a story of a, a public information officer at University of California talking to a senior scientist, physicist, trying to get him to explain his latest theory in layman's terms. And he was going on like that guest was. And finally she said, you know, just pretend you're explaining it to your mother in terms that your mother would understand. The scientist looked at her and said, I do not discuss my work with my mother. <laughs> so. um, okay, next example. What makes uh, a complicated structure in n dimensions uh, 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 correspond to uh, an ideal uh, structure, namely uh, what, what mathematicians call an 
the atmosphere. What uh, what Poincaré did is to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, quite clearly that there is a solution for uh, a, bro a wide array of three-dimensional objects in four-dimensional space that correspond to uh, a, a single uh, configuration that is characterized by, by having a continuous surface and, and no hole. Oh, you know what? Hands up for those who understand what you're talking about. <laughs> it's my colleague Carol often as it happens. Um, poor bastard trying to explain Poincaré's theorem. Um, now, uh, people ask us what, what uh, stories you do on quirks and quarks. And um, we have, it's really simple. We do stories that are really cool or really relevant, which is why we do no chemistry ever. <laughs> okay? uh, I, I have a running feud going with the chair of chemistry at Manitoba, who keeps writing. He writes constantly saying, why don't you do any chemistry on quirks? And I say, because it's boring. Okay, so cool or relevant? What you guys do falls, some of what you do is unbelievably cool. A lot of what you do is quite relevant. Now, you don't have it as easy as biologists. And I, I just came from UBC where I was doing a training session with um, wildlife biologists and ecologists. And a lot of what they do is, to put it simply, animal sex. Well, animal sex is cool. It may not be relevant, but <laughs> It is really cool. You cannot go wrong with animal sex, even if you're studying something as obscure as barnacles. So what's uh, so spectacular about their reproductive system? Well, most other animals that are cemented to the rocks, to reproduce, they simply broadcast their sperm and eggs out into the ocean. Uh, but barnacles, they're constrained by their evolutionary history to, to require mandatory internal fertilization. And so they dealt with this challenge in, in quite a spectacular way, which is by evolving sort of the world's longest penises. The world's longest? Precisely. How long are they? <laughs> well, uh, it, it depends on who you ask to some extent, and, and we actually went and did a survey of all the world's longest penises and found the fact that barnacles do have the longest time. And, and in the species I'm studying, when they're fully extended, they're approximately four times the length of the entire animal. Four times the length of the animal? <laughs> okay, so... You, you guys aren't going to top that, so don't even try, okay? So yes, they've got it easier in terms of explaining their stuff on the radio. So I acknowledge what you do is difficult to explain. Um, maybe not as hard as cosmology, but I think nanotech, nanotech, uh, quantum computing for sure. Ray Laflamme has tried his best on quirks to explain it. I still don't think I get it. Um, it's hard. The layman's terms don't come easily. but. If you want to engage with the public, and I would hope that you do want to engage with the public, then you do have to figure out the layman's terms. Um, Graham mentioned uh, analogies. Analogies are enormously helpful, particularly in your area where uh, the layman's terms don't come easily. The concepts you're dealing with are not things that exist in my everyday life. So what you have to do on the radio is, is what we call paint a word picture. You have to create an image for me that will live in my brain so I can somehow visualize what you're describing. Um, so you really want to put some effort into thinking about the analogies, paint the picture for me of what you're trying to do, and really find those layman's terms. Now, if I have a few more minutes, uh, I just want to quickly explain, um, jumping entirely to a different area, why you have to return my phone call <laughs> <clears throat> the day I call you. Now, <laughs> um, uh, for Rob, he wants you to return his phone call in the next five minutes because he's got to get his story on that day. Um, I'm dealing in a different realm, which is in uh, papers in the scientific journals. And I want to explain a bit the, about the embargo system, which probably most of you don't know about or don't know how it impacts my life, which means it impacts your life. So, okay, so you're, you've been working on quantum computing for the past 15 years. You finally get a paper in science or nature. This is the height of your academic career. You're really excited. You're really proud. And I hope that you want to talk to the media um, about your paper. So what happens is the major journals, uh, like Science and Nature, they send out a press package to registered science journalists a week before they publish. 
and it's under strict embargo, which means we cannot release any details until the embargo is lifted. Now, the idea behind the embargo system is it gives us time to, um, for print or TV to commission graphics, to commission visuals, um, but most importantly, it gives us time to actually understand the science. And the science is very complicated, as we all acknowledged. So it gives everyone a chance to actually phone the lead author, do an interview with the lead author, speak to some other people in the field who can help explain it or comment on it, and I hope in the end, come up with a better piece of science journalism. But here's the, here's the key thing you have to understand. The embargoes are lifted at a very specific time. I think it's one o'clock on Wednesday for nature and noon on Thursday for science, or the other way around. Um, but it's, it, it's at an exact moment. And if you're on the internet, you'll notice at one minute past one on Wednesday, hundreds of websites from CBC to BBC to New York Times all publish the identical story at the exact same moment about the latest fossil find or whatever the big paper is. That's because they've known about this for a week. They've already done their interviews, they've already written the story, and at 101, as soon as the embargo is lifted, they hit publish and their story goes out on the web. Now because of the nature of competition in the media world, and because of the 24-hour, 24-7 news cycle, if everyone in the world is going to publish that story about your paper in science at 101 on Wednesday afternoon, by Thursday morning, I have no interest whatsoever in your paper. I couldn't care less. So, if I call you on Monday and you call me back on Friday, I'm sorry, you've missed your 15 minutes of fame. Because that's the nature of the news cycle. Yeah? Will you also send me an email just in case I'm not sitting in my office? <laughs> we absolutely, I don't know, my colleagues, uh, we primarily um, communicate via email, which has really actually changed our whole way of reaching scientists because I find, um, particularly with biologists who do a lot of field work, they send out an email and 10 minutes later they email back and say, I'm on a boat in Patagonia, um, should be back in the office on Tuesday, can I call you then? So um, the scientists are usually quite good about, about that. So I'm just trying to explain um, why it's important that you uh, try to get, if you want to get your message out, if you want to get your 15 minutes of fame, if you want to get your paper in the New York Times or on Quirks and Quarks, calling back a week later, or I must say this happens an awful lot, um, scientists do return their call and they say, oh, I'm working on a grant proposal, I'll, can I call you next week? Well, next week is just too late. And boy, I don't know about you guys, but some of you spend so much time on grant proposals, I don't know how you get any work done. So I just wanted to explain a bit of uh, the landscape that we operate in and uh, why it's important for you to uh, get back to us on that. Uh, I'll end on that.